Now, you may have thought that that was very easy to find, but in fact, I spent hours finding those things because I didn't realize. Let's see if I can, OK, let's get, change. I'm trying to figure out what is the best lighting for us here. OK, I want you to be able to see the, can you see the screen OK? Yes. OK. Uh, that's the present-day German flag, the present-day Italian flag. That is not the German flag of national unification, which I will get to in a moment. I couldn't find one of those that actually waved. And since I was partial to ones that waved, uh, I uh, <laughs> stuck with the one that is the current German flag. Uh, OK. Just to show you how influential Wagner is, basically right up to the present. But this is a particularly interesting piece Right of the Valkyrie, because it's part of Wagner's revival of German mythology as part of nationalism. And unfortunately, this had its less pleasant sides. This was first performed in 1870. It was actually performed underground before Wagner even wanted to release it before then, because people were quite taken with this particular part of it, the ride of the Valkyrie, a piece that I've always, always, always loved. Uh, in 1865, Wagner published a work in writing, because he also wrote. He wrote a lot, but he wrote especially music, but he also wrote prose. And he wrote a piece, which is infamous now, called What is German? Was ist Deutsch? And I, I have it down here for you, just so you can look at it later if you would like, when I put up the, the PowerPoint. Deutsch, that is German, is accordingly that with which we are familiar. That sounds OK. What we have inherited from our fathers. That sounds OK. What has sprouted from the earth. In other words, it's natural. It th denotes, therefore, those people, and now we get our people and other people, those people who remained in their place of origin. That is, people who are not immigrants, amongst others. Uh, continuing to speak their primeval mother tongue, German, while those in the former Romanic countries, Italy and especially France, gave up their mother tongue. Now, what other people would this have been directed against? You can tell by looking at the slides. The Jews. So for Wagner, the Jews were those people who moved around, didn't have a place of origin, and assimilated to other societies rather than maintaining their own primeval mother tongue. Well, of course, someone like Wagner actually might have been favorable to Zionism, therefore, the idea that the Jews should have their own homeland and their own language, Hebrew. But in this period, before Zionism becomes an important force, uh, before Zionism, in fact, exists, uh, Wagner sees the Jews as the exemplar of those peoples who lack roots. Okay? All of his operas are about the mythological roots of German identity in the German primeval forests. His music was extremely powerful, and there are many musical innovations in Wagner. Uh, he has programmatic music, music that is meant to convey a specific emotion at a time in the opera, much more programmatic than previous opera music. And Wagner became a kind of rage in Europe, especially in the 1880s. Though after the French defeat, which we'll hear about today, at the hands of the Germans, Wagnerism, the subject of a dissertation in our department, a very wonderful dissertation, uh, became a problem in France. So the first time that a German op by an opera by Wagner was, was staged in Paris after the defeat of 1870, there were riots that prevented its performance. Because Wagner was associated with German nationalism, and as we see from this quote, his nationalism was not just anti-Jewish, it was anti-French. The French, he saw, as people who had given up their original selves from their, their, sort of, their origins in ancient Gaul. They were taken over by the Romans, and therefore they were corrupted. The Germans were never defeated by the Romans, is his line. It's not entirely true. They 
defeated the Roman Empire when they invaded in the 5th century AD. The Germans, therefore, are a superior people. This will be part of something we're talking about this week and next week, the increasing notions of national and racial superiority, which the Ride of the Valkyrie is very much related to, along with its obvious relationship to military violence, which we saw in both Apocalypse Now and in What's Opera Doc, which is, by the way, from 1946, 1947, uh, a Warner Brothers cartoon. OK, so we're going to linger a little bit on the introduction here. This period is often described, and in the textbook this is taken up as well, as a period of realpolitik. That was the name that Bismarck gave to it. Gave to it. But in general, as a period of realism. That is, after the romanticism that had been so important artistically in the first half of the 19th century, we have now a new artistic movement arising called realism. But it's not just in art. It's in science and it's in politics. And one might even say it's in the study of society, trying to have a more cold-eyed view. This has pluses and minuses. On the plus side is a greater attention to the realities of ordinary life, which we see in Gustave Flaubert's typical realist novel, but he's the one who really gets it going as a genre, Madame Bovary. OK, who's read Madame Bovary? Tell us about Madame Bovary. Camille. Yes. OK, it talks about a provincial woman. Actually, Flaubert based this novel about a woman named Emma Bovary on a piece he read in the newspaper, one of those interest articles, or uh, what do we call them on, when they're on television? The sort, of in, the, the, the sort of daily life pieces, some interesting event that isn't of world-shattering importance, but that tells us something. The news is actually total, really caught up with this in many ways. We're much more likely to hear about oh, the, the unfortunate story in Tracy, California, where the next door neighbor apparently murdered the girl next door than we are to hear about anything happening in Africa to anticipate next, year, next week, or for that matter, anything much happening in the rest of the world other than in our own country. Well, Flaubert was reading the newspaper and came across this story of a woman who committed suicide uh, because she'd been found out, well, because she had actually gone through a long, he makes up a whole long story about this, a woman who's married to a provincial pharmacist who is Mr. Boring itself and finds herself interested in a young man who comes to town. She's living in the middle of nowhere, the back of beyond, and she has a desire for greater things in life. And this desire for greater things in life actually drags her down over a long period of the novel, because the novel, Camille Wright, is not short. No, it's a, very, it's a long novel, which is why we, you didn't have to read it for this purpose, but it's a great novel, really worth reading because it's a novel that had an influence basically on all subsequent novelists. But here, Flaubert said it's not a novel about a great person. It's not a novel even about an interesting person. It's a novel about an everyday person and what their lives are like and how tragedy can even be found on this very ordinary level. So we have realism in literature. In the document reading, you have a little piece from Darwin's Descent of Man. Darwin would be a, is a crucial figure in this notion of realism. And he is also a perfect example of the controversy that can be associated with this point of view. Of course, in Darwin, the repercussions spread out to every aspect of life. And it, too, has its pluses and its minuses. It's an enormously important scientific breakthrough, probably the most important since Newton at the end of the 17th century. And it challenges the entire 
notion of what it means to be a human being. It's not just what humans can accomplish. Newton showed the power of reason. Now the power of reason, if you will, destabilizes the position of the human being. This will open the way to a whole series of developments at the end of the 19th century that we'll talk about, in which humans are no longer seen as so special. Their, let's say, their less attractive qualities will become more important at the end of the 19th century. In the Nietzsche that we're going to read, and that you're going to have a document quiz on, and especially in the work of Sigmund Freud, who will talk about the irrational side, as opposed to the rational side, of the human being. So Darwin's breakthrough about evolution, that humans are the way they are because they are descended from, from other kinds of animals, primates, completely challenged the notions as humans as having a special relationship to God that other species could not possibly have had. One might say a plus of this is it opens the way to greater attention in our time to the Earth and to other species of animals. Are they so different from us? Is our place so special? Do we have the right to torture animals because we're somehow special? Darwin opens the way to this line of thinking, but at the same time he challenges all of the traditional religious positions. Nowhere in the Bible does it say there is natural selection. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that human beings, human beings are created by God, right? Directly in the Bible. They are not created through a long process of evolution from other species. So this was enormously threatening, and indeed, as we know, it is still enormously threatening today, because there is still argument about evolution. Now, the key in Darwin, moreover, is that natural selection is random. Therefore, it does not represent a transcendent supernatural will. It just happened through a series, one could almost say, of accidents. So it challenged the whole notion of what, for, for many people, kept the, made, made the universe have the meaning it had. Now, what was also important about natural selection, again, the plus and the minus, the brilliance of it was that it depended on no one's will. It happened through a natural process over extremely long periods of time. The negative side of this is that it would be picked up by what are called social Darwinists. And you're reading a document from Walter Badgett, by the way, is how he the English pronounces name. Don't ask me why. That's how they pronounce it. It's not bag a hoe, which you might think, <laughs> or badge a hot. It's badget. Okay, shows how this could then be twisted into a doctrine of racial superiority. If natural selection was about the survival of the fittest, the social Darwinists would argue, then those who have, who are superior, are there because they are the fittest. Europeans dominate other peoples because they are the fittest. This was completely contrary to what Darwin was, in fact, talking about. When Darwin talked about race, he was talking about pigeons. He was not talking about people. He was not interested in arguing for the superiority of one group over another, because for him, evolution took centuries. And what was going on in the 1860s or the 1870s was an, a, a tiny portion of the process that really had meaning for Darwin. But you can see how this fit into realism. This is a more cold-eyed view of the world, too, that the world we live in is not about the things that we think it's about. What's really going on is this process in nature in which there is a struggle for survival. Okay. So this realism takes various forms. Then we're going to linger today, in particular, on the form it takes in politics. It's hard to capture this in a textbook chapter. 
And by the way, we have now ventured into that terrible territory of the chapters that I did not write in the textbook. Therefore, I do not know them by heart. I actually have to read them too, the way you do, although I have read them many times before. And, uh, and let me say, in passing, this was true even of the previous chapters, if you find a mistake, typographical or otherwise, send me an email. We're desperate to get people to tell us things that don't work or mistakes that it's easy to overlook in the proofreading process. So please don't hesitate to tell me. And if you hate these chapters, it won't hurt my feelings, so you can tell me that too. Uh, whereas I know you adored the previous ones because they were so lively and filled with wonderful information. OK. In this period, then, what it's hard to capture in a textbook chapter. In 1848, there is this great upsurge of optimism about what people can accomplish together. There are revolutions in Paris, in Vienna, in Milan, in Berlin, in Prague, in Rome, you name it. And everyone thinks, ah, now we will be able to establish constitutional forms of government everywhere, and perhaps even achieve national unification in the case of the German states in particular, with the Frankfurt Parliament. It's in a moment of great optimism and hope for the future. And all that is dashed to pieces by the failure of the revolutions. You get the restoration of the monarchs in Austria and Prussia. You get the defeat of the Italians who want national unification. The Prussian king refuses the crown of emperor of Germany. And France ends up with another Napoleon. So the atmosphere in the early 50s turns away from that kind of romantic hope and optimism. And Bismarck will incarnate this new era, because he's actually there in 1848. And he's actually giving speeches at the beginning of the 1850s, as he's first coming into public life. And most famously, he will say, we have to, these things can only be accomplished by blood and iron. Blood and iron meaning warfare. And that will be realpolitik. Realpolitik, meaning realism in politics, means you do what you need to do to achieve your aim. Forget about you know, being sure you do it the right way. The end will justify the means. And we will see how that works. And as a result, both diplomacy, because it's not just warfare, both diplomacy and warfare will prove to be essential in the formation of the two big new nations, Italy and Germany. They won't be built from an upsurge from below, though in Italy there is some of that, as we'll see. They will be built through the manipulations of those on top. So it's not going to be a parliament of deputies in Frankfurt that's going to unify Germany. It's going to be Bismarck manipulating telegrams, manipulating public opinion, and winning wars he didn't know he was going to be able to win that will lead to the unification of Germany. And then one last general, two last general points that are really important, and perhaps the most important points to get out of today. Because I don't want you to know all the dates of Italian unification and all the dates of German Ita unification. I want you to know that Germany and Italy did not exist before the 1860s or 1871 in the case of Germany. That, that there is no Germany or Italy before then. And there is afterwards. Now, this raises two really interesting, broad questions that are the interesting questions for today. The first of these is, what is it about nation states? We take it so for granted, the United States of America, Great Britain, France, Spain, Italy, Germany, Belgium, or for that matter, the decolonized nations of Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, Tanzania. The entire world is filled with nation states. Why? The fact is, the dominant forms of government before the beginning of the 19th century, even, were empires on the one hand, the Ottoman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, 
later the Austrian Empire. Uh, in, the, in the East, also empires. In the past, the Roman Empire. Or much smaller units, city-states. Hamburg is a city-state into the 19th century. Venice is a city-state into the 19th century. City-states, not just the city, but city and surrounding territory. So why do we get this intermediate form? Not multi-ethnic empires, not tiny little city-states that represent the interests of one very small location, but this intermediate form supposedly organized around nationality. Because one could say that this is one of the hugest problems of the modern world, that attempting to bring together nationality and state formation has created massive numbers of problems. In today's news on my way to school, they were talking about the fight to the death now between the Sri Lankan forces on Sri Lanka and the Tamil Tigers. The Tamils are a different ethnicity from the ethnicity of those who are the majority on Sri Lanka. This is just a small, relatively small island torn apart by this ethnic division because the idea is who's going to control the state. Well, I have to tell you, there is no one answer to why the nation state. It seems to be the case that especially with the rise of industrialization, it was easier to manage the mobilization, for example, of armies on that level, easier than on the level of empires, far flung with enormous distances to cover. There was the rise of nationalism, which made this even more true, the notion that a people should have its own form of government. But as we'll see in a moment, even Italy, which I believe on the map in your textbook shows up as one language, in fact, in the 19th century has 33 languages. And Cavour, the uniter of Italy, does not speak Italian as his first language. Okay, so the whole notion that all these nations are so united which has caused enormous problems in the United States because we're like, how come everybody here isn't exactly the same the way they are in England, France, Spain, or Italy? Well, it turns out England, France, Spain, and Italy are not nearly as homogeneous as the textbooks would have you believe. So you want to think about, so what is it about nation states? And why do they end up being the form that everybody wants? Well, one answer is nationalism in which the dominant national group is able to convince everyone else they need to be part of the same political system. And then the second question that you want to keep in mind, I've mentioned this before, is does the relatively late unification of Italy and Germany explain why we get the rise of fascism and Nazism in the 1920s and 1930s? Is it the relative lack of integration of these nation states that makes them susceptible to this new form of unification through ideology, mass mobilization, and in particular in the Nazi case, through seeing some other group explicitly as the enemy? Of course, in the Nazi cases, we'll see it's not just the Jews. It's also the Russian Bolsheviks, and it's also the Slavs of Eastern <coughs> Europe. But so keep that in mind. You know, what, what is this about nation states? More important to think about that than to remember all of the details. Now, the textbook is very good on explaining that much of what happens in national unification, in fact, has its origins in a war we rarely talk about in the United States the Crimean War. It's incredibly important to the English because it is the war of the famous Charge of the Light Brigade in which all the soldiers are killed. And it was a great scandal in England. And it led to a great poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson. And it really kind of grabbed the English imagination. 
It's also the moment for the emergence of Florence Nightingale. So the Crimean War for the English is enormously important. It doesn't loom very large for us. It perhaps should, because it will show, in a way, it will foretell the horrors of the Civil War in the United States. Because what is happening is that new forms of military technology are going to be far out ahead of battlefield strategy. And as a result, already in the Crimean War, we will get the phenomenon that we will see in the American Civil War and also still in World War I. That is almost imaginable levels of casualty, which the military leadership seems incapable of doing anything about. So in the Crimean War, there are 500,000 casualties. The bloodiest war of the 19th century, other than the American Civil War, at least the American Civil War seen as a, as a percentage of the population. So the Crimean War is incredibly bloody. There are new forms of technology. There are new kinds of shells for firing, which turn out to be really effective. This is the first time the telegraph is used to send information back home, in this case, Newspaper dispatches are being sent by telegraph back home, so the home population in England and France knows what is happening in the Crimea, which is, for the most part, not good for anybody. Railroads are being used to mobilize troops for the first time, as they will be in the Franco-Prussian War as well. And you also have, not unlike World War I, a fairly indecisive war. There was no way France and England were going to invade Russia, a much bigger country with a huge army. They wanted basically a symbolic victory. And they got one at Sebastopol in 1854-55. So what happens is, and what's new about the Crimean War, is that now we see how realpolitik is already at work. Not that there weren't elements of this already in the 17th century and even in the 15th century. That is, look who the allies are. France and Britain are allied with the Ottoman Empire, the life, the, the longtime enemy of the West. The Islamic power of the Mediterranean is now allied with France and Britain against the Christian power, Russia. Austria is neutral, agrees to be neutral, which is why the French and the British league together to attack the Russians. The, the cause of the war is basically a, a made-up cause. They're waiting for an opportunity to go to war. They go to war. They think they're going to be able to defeat the Russians quite quickly. This turns out not to be true. But eventually, they do manage to get control of the Crimean Peninsula, which is why it's called the Crimean War, and that leads then to a settlement after three, basically three years of fighting, incredibly terrible fighting, that leads to no change of territory. It simply leads to a kind of humiliation of Russia in the peace treaty, and a signal that people will ally, countries will ally with whomever they please to get ahead. Now it's a question of your advantage. Religion is not an issue. You can ally with the Ottoman Empire against a Christian power, not a problem. Uh, you just want to improve your standing, and in particular, in this case, it's Napoleon III of France who wants war to bring France back, to bring France back from the days of being ineffective after the defeat of Napoleon. It wants to count. Napoleon III wants to count as a major power again. And then, so there are two major outcomes of the war. One is it leads to a massive reform movement in Russia, which will, over the decades, set the stage for the Russian Revolution. The, the Tsar will reform from above, starting with the abolition of serfdom in 1861, not that far distant in date from the abolition of slavery during the American Civil War. The abolition of serfdom, and you will see there are, I, I was looking at a recent book 
there were at least 11 million adult male serfs, as many, the textbook says, counting all the family members, as 50 million serfs who are now being emancipated and whose position will now be unclear. In principle, they own no land. The question will be how they will be, get a means to support themselves no longer being serfs. This will contribute over the long run to the beginning of industrialization of Russia at the end of the 19th century to further reforms, including constitutional reforms, and then we'll talk later about how that sets the stage then for the Bolshevik Re Revolution of 1917. So one big outcome is the huge changes in Russia that result not from military occupation, but from the defeat and what it signals about the need to modernize. Because modernization will be a response to the need to fight your enemies throughout the 19th century. Most countries will modernize because they need to figure out how to have more successful armies, better technology, better control of resources in order to be able to hold your own in this increasingly, as they see it, Darwinian world of the struggle for survival. The second thing that emerges from the Crimean War is this makes Napoleon III more confident about his ability to intervene, not by himself militarily, but militarily with the aid of diplomatic maneuvering. And this will be crucial to Italian unification. But meanwhile, at home, a little sidebar, because this had to be left out of the textbook in the interests of being concise, Napoleon III undertakes the most impressive rebuilding of Paris ever undertaken. Modern day Paris is the Paris created in the 1850s and the 1860s. Under the prefect of the Paris region, the Baron Haussmann. So that's why it's called the Haussmannization of Paris. Keeping in mind this was the city with 250,000 horses <coughs> dropping their doo-doo on the streets day and night, and in which really the sewers had not been much redone since medieval times. What happens is a massive tearing up of the streets of Paris, because now water demands are just increasingly greater. Uh, and this, another sidebar, a sidebar of a sidebar, the water demands increase because of the wonderful invention of Thomas Crapper, yes, that is his name, the flush toilet in the early 19th century. The flush toilet was invented in the early 19th century by Thomas Crapper, which is where we get to take a crap. Uh, and this meant you needed to have water delivered to apartment buildings, usually through cisterns on the top, but the water had to somehow be brought up to the top. Rather, you could not carry enough water in pails to run a flush toilet. You had to have a source of water. So increasingly, there's a demand for water. People want more than their two baths a year that they'd been having before. They want more access to water. So in these new apartment buildings that are going up that have four, five, six floors on them. So Haussmann tears up the streets of Paris. This has an advantage also in terms of fighting urban rebels. They widen the major boulevards. They put in something like 250 miles of rebuilt streets that are much broader. This is long before the, auto car, the, the automobile, long before gas-driven vehicles. We just have horse-driven carriages, but they're much broader. They allow vistas. If you've ever been to Paris, you know this. And they also allow movement much more easily. In the past, what there had been was very tiny streets, often very narrow. You can still see them in the fourth arrondissement, in the Marais, if you, if you go to Paris. The small streets of old 18th and pre-18th century Paris are now ringed and run through by huge boulevards that allow for crowd control and also better movement. At the same time, new sewers, hundreds of miles of sewers are built, 
and hundreds of miles of aqueducts are built to bring water to Paris. The sewers are divided into two funnels, basically, one for sewage and one for water. Water, wastewater, meaning water that's there from a storm sewer. Uh, so, and then the, the, the waste of Paris is carried much further downstream than it had been before. So this is all, there's a massive urban renewal going on, and so we get the Paris that we know today, that you see in this painting from Pizarro, the Impressionist, from 1898. But this is already true by the end of the 1860s and early 1870s. This is the corner where the Comédie Française is right over here, still today. You can always go and see it when you go to Paris. The opera, which was finally completed in the early 1870s, is down here. And this is the Boulevard de l'Opéra, uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale, where I spent many days uh, doing researches back here uh, on this corner. So this is what Paris looks like even before cars. We have this massive reworking of the grid of Paris, and this will go on in other cities in, in Europe, especially Vienna at the end of the 19th century. All cities will need urban renewal to meet the problems, political problems, but also the social problems created by urbanization. So Napoleon III is doing that at home, and then he's very busy abroad. And so we get to the story of Italian unification, on which we will not linger long. Uh, just to remind you of the dates. Constant uprisings in the 1820s, in 1830, and again in 1848, to try to get away. Northern Italy is under the control of the Austrian Empire, right? under the control of Metternich, all during that period. The only person who's independent is the king of Piedmont, Sardinia. Kind of a weird combination that has to do with dynastic uh, inheritance. The king of Piedmont, Sardinia, will be the key to national unification. Even in the 1820s, the king of Piedmont, Sardinia, is looked to as the possible military leader against the Austrians. The problem for Piedmont, Sardinia, is it is small. The Austrian Empire is large. It needs a partner. This partner is Napoleon III. Cavour, who is the premier for Piedmont Sardinia, will lead the way towards unification, but he will do it by working with Napoleon III. So I want to remind you, for example, of, I want to just read a section from the document book because it's just an amazing statement of how this works as are the letters in here from the Bismarck period. This is Cavour writing to King Victor Emmanuel. He's just met with the French emperor. After we had settled the fate of Italy, the emperor asked me what France would get. They decide at this meeting that they will create a pretext to start a war against Austria. And that the result of the war, when the French are involved, if, assuming they win, is that, that there will be a new Italy, starting with the north of the country. What France would get, and whether your majesty would cede Savoy and the county of Nice. I answered, I love this, I answered that your majesty believed in the principle of nationalities, because many of the people in Savoy and Nice spoke French, and as you know, they are now part of France today, at least most of Savoy and all of Nice. Your, your Majesty believed in the principle of nationalism and realized accordingly that Savoy ought to be reunited with France and that consequently you were ready to make this sacrifice. Then we proceeded to examine how the war could be won and the Emperor observed that we would have to isolate Austria so that she would be our sole opponent. That was why he deemed it so important that the grounds for war be such as would not alarm the other continental powers. Better still, if they were also popular in England. So there's a, a manipulation of public opinion going on to isolate Austria, talk up the cause of Italian unification and the way they're being oppressed by the Austrians. France will get involved and basically lend the crucial military support needed to defeat the Austrians and get control, therefore, of Lombardy to start with. Lombard, first, Lombardy will be the first part that they get control of. And then the different colors you see are the different parts that get 
involved, that get unified over the course of time. By the 1860s, we have popular uprisings in the South, uh, led by Garibaldi, the hero of independence already in 1848. And he will meet with Cavour and agree to bring this whole part of Italy into alliance with Lombardy and Piedmont Sardinia. When Prussia defeats Austria for its own reasons in 1866, they'll get the territory of Venezia around Venice. And when France loses to Prussia in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, they will get the Papal States around Rome. Therefore, Italy is put together piece by piece through diplomatic maneuvering and warfare, carefully chosen, carefully chosen positions in the 1850s, the 1860s, and finally, 1870. So it is unified only at this point in the loosest sense of the word. Italy will therefore be dominated from the start by the North. Piedmont is where Turin is. It's where the automobile industry will be located. It's where Fiat is uh, today still. And the North, the earliest unified parts will set the tone for the country. They will establish a constitutional monarchy. The South will feel that it has never been really paid attention to in all of this that has happened. Uh, the Garibaldi's efforts in 1860 start in Sicily, the southest, the southernmost part of the south, if you will, culturally and in every other way. People in Sicily speak overwhelming Sicilian, not Italian. And a tiny little group of people speaks Albanian, actually, um, already, even up, up to the present. So the south speaks different languages, has different culture, gets unified to the north because Gal Garibaldi in 1860 basically gives in to letting King Victor Emmanuel become the head of the country and establishing a constitutional monarchy instead of having a democratic republic, which is what Garibaldi had wanted. There will always be these tensions in Italy between the north and the south and between more democratic solutions and more liberal constitutional ones. And Italian politics to this day is still structured around the tensions created during the wars for national unification. Now, this map did not turn out well because of this black background, but it just gives you an idea. Each color is a different linguistic group in Italy in the 19th century. So that gives you an idea of Cavour spoke Piedmontese as his first language, Italian as his second language. Everyone knew Italian for the most part who was educated, but it wasn't their first language for speaking. This remains true well into the 20th century. I have friends who still speak dialect who come from the Piedmontese region even today. OK, German unification. Now, this, this is a, a fascinating story, too. And in some ways, much like the Italian story, except that in this case, and this is perhaps really crucial, there would be no Italian unification without that initial French help. So in that sense, Italy is dependent on the other powers from the very beginning of its existence as a unified nation. Germany is unified from within by the major northern German power, Prussia. Okay? Prussia, one of the possible IDs on the exam, Prussia is, Prussia is a very bizarre state. Uh, by this period, it is, this is East, this is, this is East Prussia, which is today, this, today this is part of Poland. It has large Polish-speaking peasant community. It's, it, it, this is Prussia, which is a kind of bizarre shape, and this is Prussia. Prussia includes territories on the westernmost side of what is today Germany and on the easternmost side. And then everything in between belongs to other people. So Prussia is a very peculiar place. It is dominated, however, by the eastern landowners called the Junkers. So the unification of Germany happens from within. It happens through diplomacy and warfare, 
but it happens through diplomacy and warfare engineered entirely by the Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. So Bismarck is able to do this with his armies, the armies of his emperor, well, not, he's not yet emperor, his king, William I, rather than with the armies of an outside power. So Germany unifies from within, but the first question that will be answered, and the most important question that will be answered is, is it going to be unified by Prussia, or is it going to be unified by Austria? Is it going to be a German kingdom that even includes Austria? These are big questions until unification happens. And again, with enormous importance for the 19th and 20th century, unification happens through the activities of Prussia, and it does not include Austria. So from the very start, there is not a perfect alignment between German-speaking peoples and the new nation state. This will give Hitler the excuse to annex Austria in the 1930s, because there had always been an issue about the relationship between Austria and a bigger Germany. How big would Germany be? Would it include Austria? No, it would not include Austria. It would include Prussia. It would include the Kingdom of Saxony. It would include the Kingdom of Bavaria. And it would include a host of other states in between, including places like Hamburg and Lübeck, which were independent city-states. How does this happen? OK, first, Napoleon unifies Germany to a certain extent. We saw that already. We're going to go over this very quickly. He creates a confederation of the Rhine, which replaces the Holy Roman Empire. In 1815, there's a German confederation of 38 states, dominated by Austria. In 1834, the Prussians set up a customs union, no tariffs within this Zollverein, it's called, customs union. But Austria is not part of it. It's the first sign that there will not be Austria in the new German nation. 1848, the Frankfurt Parliament fails. Uh, then King Frederick William IV refuses the crown. He, is the, he dies and then in this period is replaced by William I. Otto von Bismarck is himself an East German landowner, a Junker. His official title is foreign minister and minister president of the cabinet. And we see in the documents, which we don't have time to go over today, we see in those documents how the German liberals respond to what Bismarck does. There's, in the 1850s and 1860s, Germany has representative government, but it's only representative at, for the highest levels of property owners. But there's an elected legislature. And it is completely at odds with Bismarck all through the 1850s and early 1860s over money. Now, it's not a German legislature, I should say a Prussian legislature. And the letter of airing is are extremely interesting because the liberals in the legislature were completely opposed to Bismarck's plans for unification through uh, warfare. He does this very cleverly. In 1864, he allies with Austria, talks the Austrians into allying with him to defeat the Danes and get control of Schleswig-Holstein. Now, exactly what Austria thought it was going to get out of this, since these territories are really far away from Austria, is less than completely clear. By 1866, of course, Bismarck is at war with Austria over these territories. He is not going to share them with Austria. He is going to get complete control over them. In 1867, in response, the Austrians form a new form of government, a joint Austrian-Hungarian monarchy, in which they're dual powers rather than Austrian domination. In 1870, and by the way, when, when he defeats Austria, then Italy is able to take over more control of territory in Italy. In 1870, he engineers a war with the French. The French actually declare war because there's such a an outrage in France over Prussian maneuvering, declares war with France. Napoleon III thinks he's going to win. He loses almost instantaneously, is arrested at the battlefield in eastern France. The Prussians then begin to invade the country. And this is the final movement of unification. In January 1871, when the Prussian king is crowned as German emperor, 
in France, and part of the settlement of the war is that Germany will get Alsace and Lorraine. In Alsace and Lorraine, people speak Alsatian dialect in Alsace, and a Lorraine in Lorraine, they speak mainly French. And there are some German speakers as well in Alsace and Lorraine. This territory will be a subject of contention all the way up to World War I. And the main reason the French will enter World War I is to get Alsace and Lorraine back. This is seen as the great tragedy in French life after the defeat of 1870 in the Franco-Prussian War. When Napoleon III is defeated at the battlefield back home, the legislature, and he's allowed more and more voting, he's got actually a pretty liberal government, overthrows him. He's, after all, in Prussian custody, so he's not around to fight this, and sets up the Third Republic. For years, I wondered why the street of September 4th was called the street of September 4th. That's the date of the establishment of the Third Republic. So Germany is unified. You see it's a huge country, much huger than it is today, because as I said, those eastern portions will end up going to Poland uh, after World War I and World War II. And this will lead to the last uprising in Paris. So diplomacy and warfare, manipulation of public opinion, pretexts for war have led to the establishment of a new Italy and a new Germany. One of the questions, if I can just back up, one of the questions for Germany will be how to integrate a heavily agricultural East, there's industrialization in Saxony, and a much more French and English style West. The West of Germany is much more like the Netherlands, Belgium, and France. The East is much more like Poland and Russia, and the issue will be how to integrate those two parts. Okay, so the legacy of this for France is that the Second Empire is overthrown, the Third Republic is created. The Prussians have defeated the French, and they are now, they've got the emperor, there are peace talks going on. The new republic is being set up. Once again, a republic set up in the midst of the worst possible circumstances. The peace treaty is being negotiated. And the Prussians are besieging Paris. Because in Paris, there is reluctance to agree to any peace settlement. What this leads to then in 1870, at the beginning of 1871, there is an uprising in Paris against the new Republican government in Versailles that is going to treat with the Germans. In response to the siege by the Germans, there's an uprising in Paris and the setting up of what is called the Commune of Paris. Commune actually simply means city government. But the Commune of Paris is incredibly important to Marx. He writes a whole book about it. It's incredibly important to Marxist thought because this is the first time that self-avowed Marxists are involved in the revolution. Most of the leaders of the revolution are still Jacobins of the style of the first French Revolution. But there's a whole mix of left-wing groups involved in setting up the Commune which tries to institute socialist policies in the three months that it's in power. After three months, the forces of the Republic, having made peace with Germany, gather their forces and march on Paris and take over Paris militarily. Once again, the Republic destroying the left-wing movement in its own territory, just as in the June days of 1848. During the Paris Commune, they, for example, the government, the, the, the Commune government, tears down the huge statue in the Place Vendôme of Napoleon I as a way of attacking the whole imperial legacy. They want to change everything, much as it was in the First Revolution. But note, we have the great Haussmann uh, squares and the great Haussmann boulevards. This leads up to the Madeleine Church on the other end. Uh, now, today, this area is you know, where the Ritz is and associated with other things than revolutionary destruction. The important point here is the level of violence between Republicans, 
20,000 insurgents are killed by the French Republican forces in one week, called Bloody Week by the French. The government side lost 900. The insurgents lost 20,000. 50,000 were arrested, tried, and in many cases deported to New Caledonia, which is near Australia, rather far away from mainland France. This was the beginning of the Third Republic, which lasted until German defeat in 1940. In fact, the longest lasting Republican government in France for all of its problems. The Paris Commune started, you see with the upper picture, upper, upper right hand picture, started with the siege of Paris by the Germans, in which the population was reduced to starvation to such a level that it actually ate all of the animals in the zoo, in the Jardin des Plantes. During the street fighting, we of course have the reappearance of the barricade. And during the fighting, the most controversial thing that happens, other than the killing of all these people, is that the city hall, the Hotel de Ville, is burned down during the fighting. This was blamed on the insurgents, but there's some question about exactly how this fire started. It was rebuilt in exactly the same form. You can see it today when you go to Paris. And then just finally, the coffins of the insurgents. To just impress upon you for one last minute, I'm going to quit a little early today because I know you have to study for your midterm. Uh, and in fact, I'll take a couple of questions about the midterm after I get done with this. Just to impress upon you the fact that this one week in French history left a lasting mark. I was interested to see that in Le Monde, which I was reading on my iPhone, sitting in the back of a car returning from the LA Philharmonic on Sunday afternoon, uh, that the former prime minister, Villepin, is saying that France is entering a new revolutionary moment because there's so much discontent now about what the recession is causing, and discontent with government reforms at the university, which has led to the virtual shutdown of the university over the last two months. So there's a lot of ferment in France right now. This is the memory that comes back to people, that the Republicans can fight amongst themselves, that Paris could once again become the site of revolutionary action, and that the result could be tragedy. So unification of the new nations has many, many, many repercussions far outside the two countries. Now, just one minute to see, and I'll let you go early, one minute to see if anybody has a question about the midterm on Thursday. Let me say, however, before I forget, you must bring your blue books with nothing written in them, not even your name. Because one possibility is that we will ask you to turn in your blue books first, and we will hand them back out to make sure that no one has written in anything in them ahead of time. So be sure to bring in your blue books absolutely blank. Because we, we may ask you to pass them to the person next to you. We haven't decided exactly how we're going to do it, but that, that's an important thing. So if you have a question about the, e about the midterm, email me, and I'll let you know the answer. <laughs>